I'm currently driving through one of the longest undersea tunnels in the world. Now, I have traveled all over the world. I've seen some amazing construction projects. But this is a feat of infrastructure like nothing else. And up ahead of me is something that you just won't see anywhere else. An entire roundabout underneath the Atlantic Ocean. I have never seen a roundabout under an ocean. I've seen pictures of this, but to be driving around it right now, deep beneath the water and underneath a load of rock is pretty unusual. Now, amazingly, this is part of an entire network of tunnels that sits down here, deep below a tiny island nation that most of you probably won't have heard of, the Faroe Islands. Way up in the North Atlantic, hundreds of kilometers from anywhere else, and with a population that could fit inside a football stadium, the breathtakingly beautiful and incredibly remote Faroe Islands has just completed a series of projects that much larger countries could only dream of. So how have these remote islands managed to pull off a task that would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, anywhere else? What are its secrets? And perhaps most importantly, how has it changed the lives of people that live here? I'm on an epic road trip from the top to the bottom of the Faroe Islands to find out. Oh my God. Oh, this is terrifying. If they hadn't started drilling the tunnel, I don't think we would actually live here. So we are now at <laughs> minus 190 meters. We're now at the deepest point in the Faroe Islands. How on earth did they build it? The power of that water, turning those turbines. The potential is enormous. These things are out there right now, quietly generating energy for the Faroe Islands. It's difficult to convey how beautiful this place is or how fresh the air is here. It's incredible. This place is incredible. Coming here just absolutely takes your breath away. So I'm stood right now in the far north of the Faroe Islands. And what you're about to see is my journey from north to south across land and sea to discover more of this magnificent landscape. To see what life is really like here and find out how people get from A to B in this most extraordinary of places. Few corners of the globe make for a more awe-inspiring road trip. Nestled between Iceland, Scotland and Norway, the small archipelago known as the Faroe Islands is one of the most isolated communities in all of Europe. Perhaps unsurprisingly, because you see it everywhere you look, Life here revolves around the water. The Faroes has a population of less than 55,000, and there are more sheep here than people. It was originally colonized by Norwegian Vikings and possibly Irish monks before that. But today, this cluster of 18 islands is now a self-governing territory of Denmark. The burning question is, how on earth does a place like this sustain itself? And the answer is by doing what it's been doing for centuries, fishing. In the cold waters of the North Atlantic, fishing boats from the Faroe Islands are hunting. That industry accounts for around 90% of this nation's exports and about 20% of its GDP. Now, the Faroe Islands is looking to diversify, using its other prize assets, that incredible scenery, to attract more overseas tourists and famous YouTubers. 
At the same time, it wants to make this a better and less isolated place to live for as many people as possible by fixing a common problem that far-flung locations like this often run into. The lack of large-scale infrastructure. It's always made getting about pretty challenging and incredibly weather-dependent. But things are changing, as I'm about to find out on this amazing adventure. But unfortunately for me, it all starts with this rather terrifying looking tunnel. Driving through this 60 year old two kilometer tunnel was one of the toughest things I've ever done. It was cramped, pitch black, and you had no idea how far you had left to travel. Every so often, your mind would drift to the enormous weight of all that rock above your car. This really isn't one for the claustrophobics. Incredibly, it's actually one of 11 single lane road tunnels in the Faroes, each carved out to create a way through this rugged landscape. But these terrifying tunnels can only get you so far. Like I said, life here revolves around the water, and up until very recently, the only option to get around was to jump on a boat. It's really hard to convey how beautiful it is here or how fresh the air is. It's amazing. This is one of many ferries that operates across the Faroe Islands. These trips normally take about like 20 minutes, half an hour. But obviously if you then need to go onto another island after that, your commute, your travel time can really add up. The other thing to bear in mind here is that it's quite a nice day right now, thankfully. But sometimes the weather in this part of the world can get pretty crazy and these ships don't even sail at all. That weather can also make just getting to the Faroes in the first place a little tricky, as I found out when I first tried to visit back in 2022. Thanks to a storm, I never made it further than Copenhagen Airport, as the few connecting flights up here were cancelled. Hopefully one day soon we will bring you a video on the ground from the Faroe Islands. Now I'm finally on the ground and excited to see the incredible feats of infrastructure that the Faroese have constructed to help take many of those inter-island ferries and that unpredictable weather out of the travel equation. What are those projects? Well... Undersea tunnels. I'm sitting here at the entrance to one between Estroy and Straymoy, the largest of the islands where the capital of the Faroes is. It's one of four tunnels that now connects these pieces of land beneath the waterways, and I'm about to drive through two of them. They're both the newest and the longest, and on the way, I'm going to find out how they were built. We're now in the Estroy tunnel, and as you can see, it's completely different to that last tunnel I was in much more modern, there's lights, which is quite nice for a driver. Overall, the Estroy tunnel network is more than 11 kilometers long and cuts journey times between Torshavn and the village of Runovic from over an hour to just 16 minutes. What really makes this tunnel unique is that roundabout. To allow drivers to head in one of two directions once they hit the midway point, the world's first undersea roundabout cleverly splits the Estroy tunnel in two. And here it is, the so-called jellyfish roundabout. You can probably see how it got that name. Standing here is incredible, right? Construction teams made this by digging in three directions, down there, over that way, and over that way, to create this central column. And it's just the most surreal thing. You wouldn't expect to find this deep down here, 70 meters underground, beneath the fjord that's up there, way above my head. What also makes this more than just your standard roundabout is the decoration. They brought in a local artist to create this sculpture and these figures, these silhouettes represent fairies people doing a traditional dance. It's a really nice touch. 
where you're down here is undeniably impressive, but the other thing that jumps into your head is, why go to all this effort? You know, this place has not got a huge population and this is an immense feat of engineering and construction. So why do it? And once you decided to do it, how on earth do you build something like this? Before we get into that, it's important to take a moment to recognise that this sculpture is more than just 80 metres of steel and some lighting effects. It's a priceless, one-of-a-kind piece of art that holds tremendous value for the Faroese. Now, there are countless other valuable artworks out there, but most of them are out of most people's reach, unless you've been investing with our sponsors at Masterworks. Masterworks investors have seen returns of 14.6%, 16.4% and 17.6% on works held longer than a year and sometimes more. It's because their team has decades of experience in the art market and in finance. They're taking a dedicated approach to art as a financial investment and offering you the best of the best offerings, from legends that even a casual fan would know like Basquiat, Picasso and Banksy. It's why over 915,000 users have signed up so far and why shares have sometimes sold out within minutes. But the B1M subscribers can still get a jump start on investing today by using the QR code you see on screen or by going to Masterworks works.art forward slash the B1M. Now, well, let's get back to the Mid-Atlantic. So, how have the Faroese managed to pull off these incredible feats of engineering? Well, tunnel building's nothing new here, as I found out earlier. Oh my god, oh, this is terrifying. Since the 1960s, they've dug more than 20, spanning over 50 kilometres in total, all as part of a policy to connect as many people as possible by road. Most of these tunnels are on land, but in 2002, the first undersea tunnel connecting Straymoy to Vowar, where the airport is, went into service. Then, in 2006, another was built between Estroy and Bordoy. 2020 saw the opening of the tunnel I'm in now, and then the massive Sandoy tunnel opened in 2023. There's also a bridge, which was constructed back in the 1970s. It links the two main islands across the gap that's just too short for a tunnel. All of that meant the Faroese kind of knew what they were doing when they built this using one of construction's more dramatic building techniques. The drill and blast method has been around since the 1800s and remains a popular way of digging long tunnels through difficult ground conditions, just like the ones you'll find in the Faroes. It was the strategy chosen by the Norwegian arm of Swedish firm NCC, the main contractor for the project. To put it very simply, you start by drilling some holes, filling them with explosives, lighting the fuse, standing well back, and then clearing away the debris. Next, the walls are covered in a layer of concrete, forming a lining for the tunnel, ensuring stability and making sure it's watertight. Basically, you repeat that for several kilometers under the ocean. In all honesty, there's a little more to it than that. And that's why I'm about to meet Titus Samuelson. He's gonna help me discover more about how these structures were built and what it takes to maintain them. Hi, sir, hi. Hi, how are you? Not too bad, good to meet you, how you doing? Titus is the CEO of the operating company for these tunnels, an entity that's owned by the Faroese government. We have a lot of things that you have in London, but when you are living in London, you have all these things, but you don't use them at all, all the time. <laughs> so, you're, you're, you're really selling it to me, actually. I might come and live here. Yeah, yeah. I guess you have all the things that we have, but you don't have pollution, congestion. Yeah, and crime. Yeah. <laughs> How long did it take to build this tunnel? It, it took uh, approximately two years to do the blast, a little bit more than two years, and then uh, a year and a half to, to do the completion. Yeah. And install electrical systems, safety systems, and doing the road and so on. It sounds like a, a stupid question, but what was the hardest thing about drilling a tunnel through solid rock under the ocean? <laughs> uh, it was actually the planning, the geological service that you had to do before to be sure that you didn't uh, come up to the sea bottom <laughs> on your way uh, over the fjord. You just have to do all the things that the, the geologist uh, 
advise you to do. Yeah. So it's not there usually. You see, with an undersea tunnel, once you've dug the hole and lined it, the battle to keep the water out isn't over. Leaks can still happen even after completion, and that means there has to be a system in place to deal with them. Hidden away next to the tunnels are a series of pumps and pipes that direct all that unwanted water back out again. This is one of the rooms where that process takes place, and it happens to be at the deepest point in the entire Faroe Islands, 190 meters below sea level. Oh wow, amazing. So you can taste the Atlantic Ocean there, really. So what is, why does this place exist? Why do you have these pub units? Yeah, this is a reservoir here. So the water w which is uh, running into the tunnel from the ocean and the seabed, it runs in here before it's pumped out. This is a solid rock tunnel you've dug. Why is there water coming in? Why do you have to pump water out? Yeah, water is coming uh, through cracks in the rocks, coming into the tunnel. With small uh, amounts of water, yeah. relatively small amounts yeah. of water. We can hear the pumps now. Yeah. But normally they are just running over the night yeah. because we have more green energy during the night. Now, this complex system isn't unique. All of the undersea tunnels in the Faroes have pumps like this, including the brand new one. But before I go and see that, I'm keen to understand where all that green energy is coming from. And that means heading over to Vest Manor, the powerhouse of this nation. Covered in lakes and rivers, surrounded by fierce tidal waters and prone to strong Atlantic winds, the Faroe Islands is the perfect place for renewable power. Now you don't have to go far to see examples of renewable power generation on the Faroe Islands. You can see the waterfall behind me and the rate at which water is falling down this mountain. Same thing is happening in these pipes over here. The water is coming down from those pipes through this building, which is a hydroelectric power plant dating from the 1950s. The power of all that going through the hydropower plant, turning those turbines, is generating clean, renewable electricity. So here you get an idea of the speed at which water is passing down through this system. It's just like that waterfall I just showed you, but they've harnessed it. Again, they've been doing that here for some time, since the 1920s in fact, and it's been growing. 2023 was a record year for green energy production, with more than half of the electricity generated by renewables. By 2030, the Faroes are planning to go a lot further, by doing something most countries would have little hope of achieving. The idea is to have all electricity generated onshore in the Faroe Islands to be renewable by then. Now, I'm here in Vest Manor, which already has a hydropower plant and a wind farm. But it's here that engineers are trying out a new method, another way of harnessing the power of another abundant resource, the ocean. Since the start of 2024, Minesto, in partnership with SEV, one of the few energy companies actually on the Faroe Islands, has been preparing to launch the world's first utility-scale tidal dragon. That's a special kind of technology that generates electricity using the power of the tide. And the first installation of its kind anywhere in the world is happening just out there in the water behind me. First off, a special foundation is built on the seabed. Next, a mini power plant called a kite is carried out to the site by boats before being tethered to that foundation. The flow of the tide and an onboard control system cause it to move through the water in a figure of eight, turning a turbine as it goes. That generates power, which passes through an undersea cable to a control station connected to the grid. We've looked into tidal uh, power for quite some years, I would say 10 to 15 years. The potential is enormous in, in the Faroes, but also the fact that we have a time-wise phase shift in the tides between the different straits. If we install tidal turbines in different places, they can provide us with what we normally say base load generation. And this right here is what one of those kites looks like. And believe it or not, this is actually a baby one. So this can generate about 100 kilowatts, but the big ones that are out in the ocean now are generating 1.2 megawatts. This weighs about 2.7 tons, but the bigger ones are 28 tons. And it's crazy to think that these things are out there right now under the waves, quietly generating energy for the Faroe Islands. 
So all electricity generation onshore will be green by 2030. And as a small society, we think that we are able to do so and maybe play a role model uh, for the whole world, becoming 100% green. By investing heavily in green energy, the Faroe Islands has proved it doesn't just care about the well-being of its residents, but has the future of the wider planet in mind too. And yet, despite this being the place that keeps the nation running, to find the real centre of power, I need to head back over to the other side of this island. And that's where the capital of this nation is. This is Torshavn, one of the smallest capital cities in the world, only home to around 14,000 people. This right here is the oldest and most historic part of this city. It's just fascinating to see the buildings, the architecture, and just explore this incredible little piece of Faroese culture. So you keep walking down from that historic quarter and you come into what's much more the centre of Torshavn. It's kind of more modern than you'd expect. But then little things hit you, like that, that building behind me, that is the parliament of the Faroe Islands. That's where this nation's 33 MPs meet. It just looks like a, a town hall for most of us. Despite its modest size, Torshavn is by far the most populated part of the Faroes. But to get the full Faroese experience, I need to go further south to somewhere that's the complete opposite. So I'm now driving through the Sandoy Tunnel, which is the newest tunnel. It opened in December 2023. This is the longest single tunnel, measuring an incredible 10.8 kilometers through the rock. With this incredible feat of infrastructure, people now have a much easier way of getting from Straymoy, that main island, across to Sandoy, which was previously only accessible by ferry. What's even more remarkable is that this island, Sandoy, up ahead, is only home to 1,500 people. and only around three to 400 cars a day are actually gonna use this tunnel. You can see at the moment, nothing's come past me, nothing behind me, nothing ahead of me. It's a huge, incredible feat of engineering, but it's dead, there's no one here. These new tunnels are a remarkable achievement for such a small nation, and they're masterpieces of engineering. But as you can probably imagine, they came at a cost. The Estroy Tunnel cost about 180 million euros, which is just under 200 million US dollars. It was the single largest investment ever in the Faroes, but for a big project, it's not actually that bad. The Sandoy Tunnel was about the same price, but when you look at the cost per head for both tunnels, it comes to over $7,000 for each person on the islands. Now, compare that with the US. In 2022, funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law came to around $1,000 per resident in most states. So where did, where did that money come from? Yeah, uh, the government established a limited company which the government owns, and then they injected over a 10 years period 50 million euros. And then we have a financing from ferries, UK-based, and uh, mainly American pension funds financing the project. So we got the financing in place in 2016 and then starting to build the tunnels. And it's paid back by right. tolls over time? Yeah. Total loans are paid back in 2040. Wow. So, uh, so six, 16 years from now, the total project is paid back. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, when you drive through an incredible feat of construction like the Sandoy Tunnel, you kind of expect to come up in a bigger city or community, but the first place you hit is Skopen, which is this small village of only 500 people. And it's the strangest thing to go through an 11 kilometer tunnel that's been blasted out of solid rock underneath the water behind me, and then come out in such a small place. So has it really all been worth it? Well, I'm on my way to Sander, the final point of my journey, to try and find out. 
I've come here to meet a family who've lived on Sandoy since before the newest tunnel was built to see what they make of it all. Good, thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Come on in. Thank you. Like a cake or...? I would love a bit of cake, yeah. yeah. Very kind of you to bake it for us. Yeah. I've never had someone make a cake for me, so that's, yeah, yeah. that's the first. <laughs> What's life like here? We have lived in Sandoy for four four years now. It's quiet, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's nice, uh, quiet village life. Um, we've both been living abroad in different places. What was it like here before the tunnel? You have to get a ferry to go to the mainland. Well, I think we were still like adjusting, but, um, but it used to take a lot of time to drive up to the ferry, wait, maybe if the weather wasn't nice, then... <laughs> They wouldn't sail. And <laughs> yeah, the ferry ride itself was half an hour, so usually you just say it takes half an hour to get here, but it's just like the waiting, and you have to wait for the ferry, and yeah, following the schedule. And when we moved here, I worked in Torsound, drove myself, or taking the bus I would probably use like three hours commuting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, <laughs> Definitely our youngest yeah. video star. Quite an easy baby. Nice. You could be getting into construction. <laughs> <laughs> I have that effect on people. You just fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had two kids since we lived here. Pregnant women uh, who were giving birth had to go to Torsan two weeks before due date. If everything went smooth. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, maybe before that, uh, in order to stay like close to the hospital. So yeah, we would yeah. be provided with an apartment uh, at the hospital. So that also makes like a huge impact on, on family, family life, life. Yeah, uh, course, in yeah. a, when you're in a kind of vulnerable situation. Uh, Especially if you have kids already, then like... Yeah. yeah. So how has the tunnel changed things? How do you feel about the new tunnel? Uh, if they hadn't started drilling the tunnel, uh, I don't think we would actually live here. So that's uh, quite a big... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, a Like, big that's, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how yeah. Of course, Barbara and her family aren't the only ones to benefit. Since this tunnel went in, over 90% of the ferry's population is now connected by road. And it feels like that strategy from the 60s is finally starting to pay off. There's even talk of another tunnel being built in the future that would become the longest by far. Joining Sandoy to the southernmost island of Suderoy, it would be at least 22 kilometers in length and could cost almost half a billion dollars. So is this a one-off or could we see other nations try something similar? Well, isolated communities in much larger countries that are also in need of new infrastructure are already looking to here for inspiration. Including one that's not too far away, the Shetland Isles off the northern coast of Scotland. Shetlanders often look here to the Faroe Islands as a model for their own future. It has a lot in common with the Faroe Islands, right? A remote North Atlantic location, a small population spread across several islands, and an economy that's built on fishing. So it kind of begs the question, could a subsea tunnel network be effective there too? Well, one action group certainly thinks so. They believe the Shetlands should have a system of their own, and they've even published a report on how to go about it. But with no autonomous government to give it the go-ahead, so far it remains a little more than an idea. For now, the Pharaohs has set a standard for construction in hard-to-reach places that's going to be very tough to beat. Being able to do the journey I've just done in a nation of this size is nothing short of remarkable. Crossing seven islands entirely by road thanks to some truly world-class construction. There's really no place like the Faroes. Life is very relaxed. I think we live a calm and quiet life. Of course, everything, everything is smaller, like it's a much smaller scale. We have this uh, Faroes nature. Living close to the sea, it's very easy to go out fishing, walking in the mountains. Probably the safest country in the world to, to be in. And normally we say that we leave the key in the car at night because if somebody steals the car, where should they go? We are close connected to our families as well. 
many people are quite, yeah, close to the family. Good for our kids to grow up in the islands as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a nice place. When you come somewhere like the Faroe Islands, it's easy to imagine that it might be somehow stuck in the past, that it's missing out on the latest construction or engineering advancements, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Working in this breathtakingly beautiful but incredibly unforgiving environment, construction teams have pulled off miracles. And the impact of their work has literally changed the shape of this small island nation for the better. What I've been most struck by is how decisions around these projects are really being taken with the benefit of everyone in mind, and you don't really get that with big infrastructure projects. Taking this amazing journey through this nation and uncovering this story has really brought home to me once again the power of construction. And it goes to show that when it comes to this amazing industry and what it's capable of, nowhere is off limits. This video was sponsored by Masterworks. You can skip their waitlist at the link below. Don't forget that we're raising awareness of construction's mental health crisis and supporting charities in this space through our Get Construction Talking initiative. There's a video series on our channel and you can find support or donate over at getconstructiontalking.org. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, from the channel that takes you to amazing projects in the furthest reaches of this planet, hit that subscribe button.